We'd like to thank Mainspring Companies for sponsoring Season 1 of The Next Entrepreneur. Mainspring celebrates the entrepreneurial journey, and we are very grateful for their support. So the idea was what we saw with iPhone. When iPhone came, that was a product which was a hardware and software both built by Apple. Right. And it worked because in Microsoft struggle, whenever they will make software, the hardware was Dell, HP, or IBM, and there will be some mismatches all the time. And people would, you know, either blame the computer or the software and nobody was happy with it. Right. So you realize when you have full control over the platform, you can actually deliver more robust products. So uh, especially in public safety arena, it was the same situation. You know, uh, most, uh, most first responders and all had gone uh, computerized by buying computers and softwares. And we came, we wanted to bring the power of cloud to it and say, hey, this is all, it's like iPhones. Again, you have iTunes services and you get your music from that. So it's all a single ecosystem. Hello, I'm Andrew McClendon, your host of the Next Entrepreneur Podcast. I'm here today with our producer, Mr. Daniel Sagona with Propel Productions, and very excited about our guest today, Mr. Mohit Vidge. Mo, welcome to the show. Thank you, Andrew. So, Mo, you're the founder of uh, General Informatics, a managed IT services company. So, why don't we start off by you explaining to our listeners what it is that General Informatics does? Sure. So as technology gets a more, you know, you've heard the term cloud and most people know there's something called cloud and it doesn't become, you know, what's, what's, what is cloud? Right. And, um, and I almost say it's like love. What is love? You know, it becomes a little <laughs> bit of a, you can define it however you want to. Uh, so essentially, uh, as, as the tech came in, you know, it's a, it was simple enough where people started doing things on their own. They would buy a computer, they would set up their, uh, they would automate their processes and their businesses. And eventually people said, hey, you need a server, you need a network, and you now you have internet, now you have email. So it started becoming a little more complicated. And then it was um, not just, it didn't stop there. Um, you have your phones, now your phones have a computer in it. You know, I mean, in your, um, your, if you are in a big building, you have elevators need to be connected to the network. Your air conditioning system needs to be connected to the network. So it all started working together and the complexity increased. So there was almost a new field created where it was managed service providers where somebody can come in and bring these pieces together. You know, we used to have copiers and copiers were standalone machines. You would spend $20,000 and put it on the side and copy. Well, if you look at it, 70% of the copiers are used as printers today. And then, you know, and almost the same percentage is for scanning documents. And when you're scanning it, it's going somewhere to a server or computer. So even, even your computers were suddenly computers and they had to work with your networks and computers. So it started growing as a field which uh, which needed some management and right. needed some you know expertise there. And, and security. Absolutely. And as you were connecting these things live to an internet connection and saying, hey, I can access your server. You know, when you say I go to a website, what does it mean? It's basically you're going into somebody's computer. And similarly, if you have a website, somebody's coming into your computer. So now we're moving across each other's domains and it's almost like virtual properties. And as we move, somebody needs to say, hey, you're not a bad guy coming here to steal something. You know, you're a legitimate person. So security became a big piece. And then when you're doing all these things, you're storing all this information. It's almost like building assets. And when your assets are there and they need to be protected, they need to be saved in insurances. So, you know, you need backups. Now, if you need backups, what something happens to your server here? Does the backup need to be somewhere else? Right. So all these things, new concepts starts, start, starts emerging in early 2000s. And there was a thing was, okay, somebody needs to manage this stuff. Well, it's also interesting when you look at 2020, uh, just from the perspective uh, in Louisiana of the storms, sure. right? And I mean, we had, I think, five storms that came through, hurricanes. And that's when backup becomes particularly uh, uh, relevant, right? Absolutely. But the other thing I want to touch back, uh, touch on maybe a, maybe a little later in the, in the show here is the impact on your business with COVID and people were working remotely and, and the complexities that that caused companies and then how you helped uh, with those solutions. But before we get into that, I, I want to back up a little bit uh, and um, 
see if you could give us a little insight into your early years uh, as a child. You grew up in India. That's correct. And, uh, Tell, give us a little, paint a picture for us about your life. Sure, sure. I, uh, so I grew up in India and, uh, you know, America was always a land of opportunity. But more importantly was I had some cousins who lived here and they would visit and, you know, tell about all the great things which were going on. It was a cool place to be in. And uh, fortunately for me, I was studying engineering in India. And, you know, there were questions even when as I was studying. And they were like, okay, if you want to learn more, you know, you there are some great universities in the U.S. And why don't you apply there? So it almost kind of, you know, I always was fascinated by what was happening in the West and uh, all the opportunities here. But at the same, you know, and this, then realized a solution to one of the problems I've started figuring academically was also available here. So it was almost an interesting match. So I um, came here and uh, not to Baton Rouge, but I came to uh, uh, Virginia. But then at that time, I had an uncle who lived in New Orleans. Um, he used to uh, run Baskin Robbins stores there. Really? Many of them. Yeah. Now, how old were you when you moved to this? This was in early twenties, early twenty one, maybe. Really, yeah. And um, and he said, "No, you need to move close to where the family is." So he applied for me at LSU, and uh, rest was as I say history. So I came to Baton Rouge, and then um, did a couple of masters. And you know, then other thing was uh, LSU. I mean, it's wonderful. Uh, most amazing thing in the U.S. was that you could actually do what you wanted to in countries like India and all. Generally, there's so much, so many, so few resources and so many people that you only, unless you're at a certain merit level, you don't get things to do. So I did a master's in industrial engineering, uh, operations research, and then I found out that my love was in computers, computer science, and uh, here you could even do that. So I went to another master's in computer science. So you ended up with dual masters? Ended up with dual masters. And so at what point did you uh, start uh, General Informatics? Sure. So I made some friends here and, uh, you know, I was about to leave Baton Rouge and they said, hey, we can start a company. And that was not General Informatics. And they said, uh, and, you know, the more, two of my academic, academic degrees lended towards, there was a concept of business re-engineering at that time. Re-engineering? Yeah. So Michael Hammer came with a very interesting concept. It says re-engineering the corp corporation. And this was a period when Japan was doing very good, you know, and everything we had Toyotas and Hondas coming here. And they said, how do we rethink the processes where America once again takes the lead? And and you know, there was a famous phrase at that time, don't automate, uh, obliterate. And I love that because it was like rethink the work. Computers are not just basically take something and make the same form on computer. You need to see what form becomes, can you make the form much smaller on a computer? And still so, so is this re-engineering kind of coming on the heels of the U.S. having lost some grounds in manufacturing and, you know, we're a global leader in, in many things and then we, we kind of lost our edge there in, in, in many respects. Is that is that how the re-engineering applied? Exactly. Okay. Absolutely. It was like, how do we re-engineer? Because we knew U.S. was leading in... Uh, uh, digital digital technology early, early 2000, late 1990s. And they were like, how can we apply this new strengths that we have to manufacturing, to improve our processes, to bring just-in-time inventories and things like that. So there was an application of uh, tech going towards other service sectors, towards manufacturing sector and bringing um, U.S. back in. And that's why after, in the Clinton era, as we saw a resurgence of U.S. economy because there was an application of and tech, um, and software and tech towards these things. So... Uh, so that's where we essentially from, you know, general informatics was born out of that idea, but it was about improving processes for people's companies. But um, it was at that time, I couldn't sell with, you know, the, uh, with this accent. I always joke about that. But uh, so, <laughs> so I couldn't really communicate the value of that. But when we reached uh, people that said, hey, things are getting more complicated. We need networks. We need servers. We need have, you know, the, all the things I talked earlier. Well, can you help with that? So... We started with something as improving processes, writing software, but ended up doing IT. But there's a difference between IT and software. And I always uh, communicate the two things are different in the sense of when you do IT, it's like a physician. And, you know, the physician can see what issues you have. They can fix it. They can do a surgery on it. And they can, you know, add some prosthetics if you want or, or do a plastic surgery to make you look better. It can do, it's, so doctors can do this stuff. But then there's a software business, which is like the pharmaceutical business where you actually create drugs or medicines and the doctors can use them. So we started as a pharmaceutical company in a sense right. and then ended up becoming a doctor and a surgeon. So that's what General Informatics is doing, the same thing what physicians would do at a different level of primary care to experts, 
but doing it for businesses. Yeah, that's a great analogy. And so um, what year, it was around 2004 where you actually started General Informatics, right? Right. So I moved out of Andrews but came back in again in 2004 and reached and started General Informatics. Now, yeah. uh, and that is that where you started in the, the business and technology center, that incubator? That's correct, LSU incubator, yeah. So tell us how that, tell us how, an incubator works and what your experience was with that and how it helps you in gaining footing with the start of your business. Absolutely. So, you know, Baton Rouge has been fortunate that we've had many, uh, I would say at least few technology incubators are, uh, as the word says, it helps you incubate or start. Right. And we had a couple of great leaders, Charlie D'Agostino, Brian Greenwood, and also, and they were trying to build an ecosystem of businesses. And, you know, I mean, I was an engineer, not a business major, or even if you're a business major, there is some uh, experience goes into building a business. Right. You know, I mean, accounting was not my forte and sales was not. So they help you build plans. And, you know, as we learn, as you grow, you realize building a plan and then executing is a better scheme than just saying, hey, let's do it. You know, so right. so they helped build business plan. And, the, and you had access to LSU professors and all, you know, who would kind of keep you accountable to what you were wanting to do. So that was another thing. It was almost like a school where you said, hey, you have, if you're saying I'm going to do so much sales and create this product, then you better do it in three months and you're going to have a meeting with them. And they tell you what happened. Why didn't you do it? Now, is is your business physically located in that technology center? So that's the other part. Uh, is in a, It's a kind of subsidized program in terms of they help businesses with a lower rent to start first, first year or so. So you have a little bit of a, so it must have a real startup feel to it as far as I'm sure there's some shared spaces and, and things like that. Absolutely. There were many businesses. I think at the time we were in the incubator, there were about 17 businesses. So, you know, you could, you made friends, you would hang around, you would discuss ideas and, um, you know, it was almost a peer group kind of feeling there too. And so, um, is there a period of time before they kick you out of the nest and say, Yes, yeah, so they have a period and they say, okay, after this period, you should kind of get out. Uh, in our case, we were fortunate because we were providing these tech services, which even the other businesses needed. Oh, I see. So they were like, hey, if you want to stay here and help the other 17 or 20 companies grow, uh, you can stay here long longer. So we took advantage of that. Oh, that's fascinating. So how long were you there then? Pretty long. We are like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um so how would you say your growth, the trajectory of the growth of your company sure. looked, you know, once you started getting beyond the uh, incubator phase? Sure. You know, it was all organic at the time. And uh, we were learning as we were going. And there was this principle of take no debt, which you later on realize is not the greatest principle when you're doing business. But, you know, it was like, okay, we want no debt and we're just going to keep doing organically. So it took longer to grow the company. Right. But at the same time, um, so till we were in incubator and we knew the rents were low, so we didn't worry too much about it. But as soon as we decided to move out of incubator and build, and really took a jump in terms of, you know, we built a pretty um, nice headquarter in Baton Rouge. And we said, okay, now our expenses are going to grow and we better start thinking of growing the company faster because we can't keep up. You know, I mean, we have to make up for the, the new expenses we're going to take on. So at that time, um, it was it was still organic, but we... And, you know, it, it, with time, there, you gain momentum, you gain a little traction in the market. We had built a name. Um, we had shown that we can we could deliver results. So it started growing. And then... Uh, and now you you have offices uh, in Baton Rouge, Lafayette, New Orleans, in the Bay Area in San Francisco? Yeah, and um, Jackson, Mississippi, we just recently opened there too. So we're, you know, so, so we're trying to grow... Um, in more regional company. But in fact, now as more things on the anvil, we're trying to grow even faster now. So there's a story I read about, um, and it relates to uh, you choosing to stay in Baton Rouge. Yeah. And it's a story about you uh, making a sales call uh, to Walmart. It, uh, I'm guessing you're in Bentonville. That's correct. Tell us that story. Sure. So, you know, I've worked with the, um, a local entrepreneur who was pretty high up in service merchandise, uh, Stevens Ring, and we come up came up with a new product, a uh, payaway, and uh, it was a finan it was a financial product, and uh, the idea came from Steve, and we kind of implemented for him as a, as a partnership, 
and then we presented it to uh, you know Walmart got interested in that and they said okay why don't you come into Bentonville and present it to us now was it like a PayPal or a, a, a wallet or yeah so it's very similar to PayPal it's a hybrid product of uh, credit um, plus layaway so you oh. know how people used to do layaway yeah, and yeah. Their, yeah. Get it. yeah so it was a hybrid product and when we went there I mean so there was um, you know we were uh, people we were sitting across were from mostly from University of um, Arkansas and uh, right. and you know and they were like oh this is a fintech it's a financial technology company and this is a fintech company out of Baton Rouge <laughs> and you know the way they said it was like oh, when did Baton Rouge started doing technology <laughs> so that was uh, that was one of the things that stayed with me and I said okay we need to change that perception and I always say that you know I came to Baton Rouge and we did pretty well and I did well for myself and uh, for people around us and I feel that you almost feel like you're adopted. And 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 I always say, often mentioned is that when you're adopted, you feel like you have a higher responsibility for people who adopted you oh, or towards them, right? So so I was like, okay, this is, it puts a mission in place that, okay, somebody's kind of making fun of us and I'm capable of, at least I can try to change that perception. So that put a new mission in my life. Yeah, that's fascinating. And then you 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 put that into play by making a, a big investment in your headquarters that you just mentioned, right? Uh, tell us about that development. Like how you, you really made a, a bold investment, uh, a beautiful design in, in what would uh, ultimately become a campus, right. Um, a very sleek contemporary building, uh, eco-friendly. And tell us like how you were able to make such a bold decision and, and, and everything that went into that. Sure. You know, once we had decided, you know, I had moved once in life already. And the thing was, and, and moving uh, is not easy in that sense of completely. And I was like, okay, now finally I find this was home. And when it's your home, then you feel like, how do I make my home better? Everybody tries for that, right? And how, what can I do? Uh, where, I, where do I have a little specialization or differentiation? And then this was one of the things that was a constant thought between me and my wife, you know, as we would discuss. And then second was, we had lost a couple of good employees to Texas. And each time they left, I asked them, and they were like, well, we're not cool enough. And that word stuck with me, and I said, okay, what do we do where we become cool for the younger generation? Because this is the kind of you know talent we're trying to keep here, and uh, and it had to have a Louisiana flavor to it. And then when we talk about Louisiana flavor, for food always comes in, and you know I'm great. Hey, this is this is great that we have the best food in the world. But it was also that what do we do which can be called you know what is Louisiana? So we we saw this property which was at the edge of the swamp. And we thought, okay, this is a great, you know, story right here that we will create technology at the edge of the swamp. So you're referring to the uh, Blue Bonnet Blue swamp. swamp, which is in the middle of the city. Exactly. It's a beautiful uh, ecosystem. Absolutely. And you, your property backs up to that, That's right? right? Yes. And um, so you're, you're kind of blending that. Yes. So we were like, how do we keep it natural? We kept the old trees and all the trees which were there and we created a very interesting engineering uh, design there. When it rains, the whole thing becomes an island. The water comes around the building. And then when it recedes, it becomes a dry land again. So almost like... A, so we wanted to kind of get these fact, those factors in. We put wood, uh, boardwalks behind the building all over the places. And it was like, okay, so we are going to res pay respect to nature, but at the same time build a very high-tech uh, both organization and a campus. And... Uh, just surprise those people in Bentonville that, okay, let's see, you know, this can be done here. And so that was part of the story or part of the strategy, I would say, you know, and that right. was good for us to attract or keep talent. And we had, we saw people um, really, you know, exciting to say, okay, we want to work here. So we started building. So that it worked out, I think. Yeah. Well, it, it, uh, it is a striking building and a great asset for Baton Rouge. And uh, I appreciate you making that, that investment. Um, I'm a big believer in how your building can be uh, a representative of your brand, of your company, and you know maybe even as much as your logo and uh, you know on your business cards. So, um, 
So it, it's it, what you have there is what about a fifty thousand square foot building? That's correct. And uh, so you take up some space, and then you would lease out some space, right? Sure. And you recently uh, started some uh, office sharing space there, right? That's correct. Yeah. And uh, tell us about HQ at Highland. Sure. You know, it's cool. So COVID, um, so we take about one third of the building. We have one more tenant Northwest and they take one third. And then we had one third space left. And the thing was we will grow into it and we hope to grow in f uh, faster, you know, sooner than we uh, later. But at the same time with COVID, saw, we saw an interesting opportunity. Despite the building, we saw people were comfortable working from homes. And, and so there was this thing that, okay, if people can work from home, they will still have, there will still be moments where they want to have a, office-like environment right. and and we and you know it's a high-tech building it's a lot of automation there and it's all glass and night so we're like why don't we share it with others and that's also a business opportunity because because even our employees started working a lot from re remotely like everybody is and we realized we have these spaces and we can increase the space and as uh, make it more dynamic in that sense you know as a shared space so that idea came stemmed from that and we had put a lot of high-tech like them you know digital thermometers and all the things we should, uh, taxi classes for COVID. So we're saying this is a, we are creating an environment which is healthy. And uh, this can also lower people's rents if they're working from home, but they've only when they, on an on-demand basis, when they need right. a very high-tech right. office, everybody can have access to it. Very cool. Well, let's take a quick break uh, right now. And I want to talk to you a little bit more about the impact of COVID as we return and we'll get in this uh, word from our sponsor. We would like to thank MBD Automation for their support of the Next Entrepreneur podcast. MBD Automation is a mechanical install contractor with a program-centric focus. So what do these guys do? They install conveyor systems, VRCs, platforms, singulators, sorters, and all sorts of other types of automated equipment. Who do they work for? They work for systems integrators, manufacturers and end users in fulfillment centers, airports, mail processing facilities, and projects in the defense industry. MBD Automation works for numerous Fortune 500 companies across the United States and has a list of international clients that they perform work for in the U.S. as well. If MBD Automation can help you on your next project, you can find them online at mbdautomation.com. And we are back with Mr. Mo Vidge, uh, founder of General Informatics. And uh, Mo, I wanted to touch on there's uh, some business recognition uh, that was very significant that you have received along the way. Um, Microsoft's best in nation uh, from a pool of 6,000 IT companies at one point, uh, which is very impressive. And then several times on the Inc. magazine, list of 5,000 uh, fastest growing firms. So that must have uh, that must have made you feel like you were doing something right. Huh? No, absolutely. And, uh, you know, whenever somebody, especially in Louisiana, when somebody appreciates it from outside, it gets more value. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So um, I wanted to talk about uh, 365 Labs. Tell us, uh, is that a standalone company? Yeah, so it's a standalone company. Uh, it came, it was a spinoff from General Informatics. You know, like I told you, we started with software first and then pivoted towards IT services. And then after doing it, IT services for a good 15 years, I realized, okay, we can start doing back what I started to do, wanted to do with the company. So we created a division there, 365 Lab, which was spinoff as its own company a few years ago. And uh, it's been a, it's in stealth mode till this year and generally stealth mode um, in, Companies is when you don't tell anybody what you're doing and you quietly build stuff. And um, um, so we've been in stealth mode for four years now and about to uh, go out in the open. And so um, can you discuss the products? I mean, 365 is actually uh, hardware as well as software uh, a solution, right? Right. Is that something you can uh, share with us, what, what that type product is? Sure. So this is... Um, it builds technology for first responders and, uh, you know, all kind of first responders, law enforcement, um, fire and I mean, medic, uh, medical and things like that. 
So the idea was what we saw with iPhone. When iPhone came, that was a product which was a hardware and software both built by Apple. Right. And it worked because in Microsoft struggle, whatever they will make software, the hardware was Dell, HP, or IBM, and there will be some mismatches all the time. And people would you know, either blame the computer or the software, and nobody was happy with it. Right. So you realize when you have full control over the platform, you can actually deliver more robust products. So uh, especially in public safety arena, it was the same situation. Uh, most, uh, most first responders and all had gone uh, computerized by buying computers and softwares. And we came, we wanted to bring the power of cloud to it and say, hey, this is all, it's like iPhones. Again, you have iTunes services and you get your music from that. So it's all a single ecosystem. And we said, okay, if we can come with an ecosystem for public safety, that's going to be an interesting story. And it's a handheld device? So one of the products is a handheld device. And, you know, as we we're saying, whatever we can do on phone today, we try to do on the phone. It's only when we can't really do on phone, we sit on the computer these days. So our thing was, even for public safety, which have computers in the cars and all things, if we can bring it to a smaller form factor, which is, you know, we say command center in your pocket, and a lot of the future movies and all, we would, we, would, we had the session one day and we said, okay, let's see how public safety will be doing in 2030. And we said, okay, this is what, you know, Minority Report is showing, but this is where we are today and where's the gap. And we said, okay, somebody's going to bridge that gap and why not us? But I imagine the investment in the research and development uh, becomes a really meaningful number. And how, how do you, how do you do that? Sure. Um, do you take on outside investors for something like that? So we are getting there where we are taking outside investments. So far, we've been you know, fortunate that we, could, we were able to do it. Now, it's interesting I'll just to do an analogy of Tesla, for example. You know, Tesla was able to build their first car in 16 months with mostly components built for other cars, other than the key technology, which was the software and batteries they brought. So it's when you realize that you know, things have moved where you can pull the comp components, assemble them together in your own unique solution, but put a secret sauce in it, which is your sauce. I see, I yeah. see. Uh, which could then get you to the point where you prove the value of it, which could then lead to exactly. sales revenue and then maybe customization of your manufacturing process. Absolutely. Later. Yeah, exactly. fascinating. Uh, let's talk about uh, some of the entrepreneurial backbone of uh, your company, which... Uh, which I always think of acquisitions as being very entrepreneurial. Of course, business startup is, but um, you've made a couple of acquisitions along the way. T tell us about those and what uh, drove you to do those and, and the, what meaning it had for the growth of your business. Sure. You know, this is also one of those things that you, you learn as an entrepreneur, uh, that you know, there is a organic growth. And then if you want to accelerate the growth, it's good to see where is a strategic fit with Sometimes your competitors, sometimes companies who are just uh, relate to, you know, work with you. And uh, we found two great companies with, led by two great people, um, local company, Technoris by Devin Zito and then TC Telecom uh, by Denver Castles. And both of them did an amazing job and we would hear about them, sometimes compete with them, sometimes work with them. And so there was a, if we could bring, if we could, we could cross sell our services with their clients and uh, there were some opportunities there, there were some synergies there. So in both those cases, um, there was a good fit. Um, both the founders decided to come on board with us. And um, so the way I see it, it was really a general informatics family growing with those uh, two partnerships and coming in. When you're doing acquisitions like that, um, at that level, does stock swaps work? I mean, or is it all cash type? Uh, yeah, so, you know, those... Uh, Depending on the deal, you know, if somebody wants cash up front, then it's a cash up front and there's no stock uh, swap. Um, you know, as, um, um, you know, we are doing something on a different side these days, which is basically we have another uh, group investing in GI and there's um, a hybrid of some solutions like that. So uh, I noticed that you had made a substantial uh, donation in kind of your 365 real-time uh, product uh, to the city of Baton Rouge and the law enforcement agencies. I was wondering if you could give us a little uh, insight to that. Sure. So, you know, though we were a stealth mode company, we were developing tech and we know this is going to become pretty mainstream tech in next year and so going forward. But at the same time, while we were working on these things, you know, Baton Rouge was always, um, there was a story about uh, uh, 
uh, you know, law enforcement uh, activities and in terms of how um, the issues we were having as a community uh, on both sides. And we felt a transparency a little bit where the law enforcement had a better uh, in into what's happening and can respond faster and people could uh, keep them a little more accountable, could work towards our community better. As And though it was a premature for us in the sense of we didn't want to tell people what we were doing, but we felt it was time to help our community and release that product. But at the same time, being our city, we wanted to make sure that there's no, I mean, we already are, you know, um, there's all these cash issues in the city. So we're like, okay, this is something we've already, we're going to make money in future anyway. So okay. it's a good uh, investment in our own community to put a real time center. And I sense that there's an opportunity for you to get, you know, meaningful feedback from uh, the agencies of, you know, what's working well or what's not, or, you know, which would be valuable to, as you develop the, that product to continue to uh, sell it to Absolutely. other agencies. It's just a two-way relationship. They've been very helpful. I mean, they've been amazing and giving us, and, you know, in the real-time center of Baton Rouge has been done at a very low budget uh, for what they've done. It's a great job. Um, uh, and we are part of it. We are a part of a much bigger system, but we get feedback from all different things happening, helping us improve our products as we go to the national market. So let me ask you, when um, when you consider, you know, the IT managed services that you had uh, been doing before you got into the 365 and you're now developing this product, and you know, um, how did that feel getting into that manufacturing side of the business? I mean, does that open like, you know, a whole lot of new set of headaches and challenges or um, you mentioned the ability to use existing components and stuff or, or, or was it something that was fairly manageable? No, it's it's a different challenge entirely. And, you know, it was also I'm kind of person I when general informatics became stable and I'm a processes person, so I've tried to put processes in place. And we, with a great team and good processes, you start automating a lot of stuff. And so I needed a new challenge in a way. Yeah, right. And, you know, so this was challenging in that sense. It's challenging enough. And, um, but it was, you're right. It's it, like I said, from medical field to pharmaceutical, it's a very different industry, though it may seem like all medical, but it's different. So in that sense, putting these things together and scale, trying to scale it at the national level, which is what we're targeting now, was a very different versus running, running IT services at a local and regional level. Right, right. So let's talk about the most recent news in which you sold a majority of your company to a private equity firm, right? And and that's a, a, a massive milestone. And I was wondering if you could walk us through that and what it meant to you professionally, personally, sure. and and uh, and then what your vision is uh, for this uh, relationship moving forward. Sure. Because, because you still own uh, a minority share in the company, right? Sure. And, you know, so this, it's a, we call it a growth capital. The general informatics needed growth capital. We realized or, organically growing for 15 years and then with two acquisitions, how it helped us. And the thing was, what will it take for general informatics to, let's say, acquire 10 new companies? And, you know, not small companies, but bigger companies all over the Gulf Coast. So that requires capital. And, you know, capital has to come from capitalists. So the private equity was a great place to go in. And we found a great partner in Rosewood. Um, it's, a, it's a family-based private equity group. And so, and also for personally, you feel, you know, you can have a, a slice of a smaller pie or you can have a smaller slice of a much bigger pie, right? right? And, uh, you know, till your slice has gone bigger, it doesn't matter if the proportions and the ratio is smaller. Right. So that was the really the gist here that, okay, we will have a, a smaller ratio, but much bigger slice of a much bigger pie. Right. So that's how the general informatics, and this is how, you know, I mean, if you look at Steve Jobs, he owns 3% of Apple, but we all call it still Steve Jobs company, right? right. So as companies grow and you grow, grow, bring capital in, you're naturally your percentage is going to dilute there. And that's how it should be because that's how things happen. And then it also brings newer opportunities for your own team, your own employees, because now they can be, who can be a, they can be a director of a much bigger company or they can be vice president of a national company. So it also opens up new uh, opportunities for your people. And then if it's headquartered in Baton Rouge, that's what part of the conditions were, then Baton Rouge has a regional company then saying we have a small local company. So it was a plus for community, it was a plus for our employees, it was a plus for us. And frankly, it gives us capital or it gives me capital to invest in something different, 365 in this case, to grow that, build a second company for Baton Rouge. So it's kind of, it's, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good 
Vindman. Yeah, that's fantastic, man. It's exciting to hear you describe that. And, and you know, I think it's it's very true that uh, some people are inclined to say, well, I own a majority of it, and, yeah. and that's more important. But the, 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 the real question is, is what is the value of that five years down the road or 10 years down the road and uh, having that capital to grow? So Rosewood, uh, this was their first foray into IT managed services, right? right. So i uh, curious how you got the comfort level that they were going to be the engine that you uh, want them to be to, to grow the business in the way that you do. Sure. So first, is do, Rosewood did a pretty good due diligence. You know, when they, they compared us against other IT companies nationally, because they, they, um, they have investments in medicine and food and many industries. I mean, it's the same family, the Hunt brothers in Texas at one time, they were the richest family in the world. So it's a, uh, and it's not, uh, like I said, it's a family owned fund. So they go in interesting fields. Uh, in tech, they hadn't ventured in tech. So they were trying to create what's called a platform which, in which you know they can attach other companies to. So uh, so in that sense, when they approached us and they said, okay, let's look at your company, but we need this, some scalable process here. Right. You know, I mean, it's like, again, you know, sounds big, but if you look at McDonald's, you know, um, there was the first McDonald's that worked and somebody replicated that model. So we're excited that they saw us uh, a company with good processes and good team where they could uh, replicate it. So, and, uh, you know, just looking at the history of Rosewood, they've done a great job. So we're like, okay, this is bad. That's, that's terribly exciting. I didn't realize the Hunt uh, family was behind that. So congratulations on that. Um, okay. So um, do you have immediate uh, acquisitions uh, in vision? Uh, and how quick do you think that, that we might see some growth from general in, informatics coming on the tails of this uh, act? So new investment. Sure, absolutely. So uh, they were, you know, we were even before uh, our deal was closed. We were looking at uh, prospects, and you know, making calls and finding out. So I, you know, again, the schedule will be now set by them. You know, I'm, um, I'm here to help them and uh, execute on their vision. Um, in that sense, of growth. But uh, we have some targets already lined up. I think uh, we'll be going after. That's very exciting. Yeah. Man, congratulations on that. What a great story. Okay, we will take a break there. Uh, get in a word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. We would like to thank Modus for their support of the Next Entrepreneur Podcast. Who is Modus? Modus is a facility services company that works in the e-commerce fulfillment industry across the United States. What do they do? They like to say they take it from the conveyor to the dock door. Well, what does that mean? It means that they're building the pick stations with the cable management. They're installing guardrails and bollards. They're putting down floor marking. They're putting up aerial signage. These guys build fencing systems, shelving systems, and racking systems. They also do rack recovery for when there's rack failures. They also install dock levelers and dock doors. MODIS also installs ASRS systems, which is automated storage and retrieval systems, as well as other robotics projects. They've worked for the largest e-commerce retailers in the world, and they can work for you. If you need to find MODIS, you can reach them online at modusmoves.com. And we are back with Mo Vidge, uh, founder of General Informatics. Mo, I wanted to... Um, talk next about the impact of COVID uh, on businesses, but particularly as it relates to IT. Uh, I was in Minneapolis yesterday at a headquarters of a, uh, a large company, and uh, the building was virtually empty. And um, many of the employees that we met with had just shown up there for the first time in eight months. And um, eight months is a long time. Uh, for people to work remote. And I sense that there are companies that are determining that this either works for them or doesn't. Uh, and curious uh, what that might look for uh, commercial real estate moving forward. But as far as the IT aspect of it goes, I mean, that brings in a whole nother level of challenges, right? How do you uh, get employees to be able to work securely remotely? So I wanted to see if you could tell us um, what your experiences has been with the companies that you've helped 
sure. uh, through this time. And then I want you to uh, tell us what your thoughts about that working, re- having employees that work remotely from your experience with your own business. Sure. See, I think the, what COVID did was that really the, the mind change. Um, the younger companies or companies who were in tech field, um, even 365, we had employees always scattered all over the country, in the world, in fact, what I meant. And, uh, and they were operating in terms of tools, um, were mature, some things that happened. There's a confluence of internet becoming fast everywhere people have band, uh, broadband, cloud, uh, which is applications working on remote servers were there. So these things that started uh, coming together and people were getting comfortable, the, the video conferencing quality and the audio quality and the ease of starting these things had started over the years getting better. But people who tried to do these things, let's say a decade or five years ago, still struggled and it was like, hey, this doesn't work. And nobody was, especially when you go to more mature businesses, financial industries and all, uh, they were not ready to try it. They were like, we tried it, didn't work. You know, there's nothing can beat face to face. And that's in a way right too. But COVID almost forced everybody to try it. And that was the thing. And it was interesting. I was reading um, some CEO of a big Wall Street company and he says, I was surprised how well it worked. And, you know, a lot of people were surprised that it actually worked. You could click on a button and, you know, after five minutes of educating yourself on something you could get online or sometimes the 15, depending on. But it was still overall, uh, you know, it it happened and it happens relatively smoothly. So once people realized that they could achieve, it gave quality time to everybody with their family, especially, you know, we can call it quality or not, but at least you were with family <laughs> and, uh, I think that changed. And for IT company, it opened up, like you said, two things. One was we had one group of companies which were already there. Then we had some people, uh, other companies that said, hey, we want to do this overnight now. So we had the period in March where we were working, I mean, uh, 24-7, trying to get these companies online who were who were not ready for this. Um, so that was um, a transition which happened very quickly. And the second was, like you said, security was an issue because now your home computer is part of the network. And can your home computer infect the business network becomes a question. And though a lot of the business or computers through a managed services company like ours are protected and updated all the time, home computers may not be. So these did pose new challenges for us. Um, Not something that we didn't have solutions for, but it was more about for uh, our clients to know that now their home computers will be kind of part of network and they will need to be protected and taken care of. Because all it takes is one single click from one computer to you know, compromise a lot of information. Right. Yeah. So, so that was a more for education and just making people aware of that. It's still not hundred percent there, but people are realizing that now it's that's a new normal. Yeah. So, so there's software licenses, right? I right. mean, as people are working remotely now, I mean, there's there's all sorts of uh, expenses and and uh, planning that had to happen to, to execute on that. So that's that's really interesting, but. Um, okay, so y- it seems as if COVID uh, created, uh, you know, a boom for your, your company there for a while. Is, was that something that maintained or was that? Yeah, so there of- was a boom for us a while. You know, our businesses are more managed services. So it's, it's not a one-time boom because, you know, then these computers are live elements right now you know it's essentially you're connected to the internet and tomorrow the new software will change a new virus will come so it doesn't stop and right. we have to be on our toes all the time you know and so it's it's one of those things where though it's new expenses but at new conveniences too you know people sure. are not having to travel so you're not spending money on gas but you know or but you're spending a little bit more money on a computer to protect it so there were some adjustments people had to make or think through that and say hey overall it's still a it's a win-win, you know. Now, I, I agree with you, the real estate market will have to rethink this whole how it's going to, you know, maybe assets are there, assets are there, but what about the new growth? So those questions are going to come. But overall, I think it was a little bit of a upswing for us, but then we've kind of maintaining that. And um, so I think it's, it's... Very good. So let's uh, change gears a little bit here and talk about some of your business philosophies, sure. right? So... One question I'd like to ask um, our guests is is kind of defining the culture of their business and what they created and what's important to them. Yeah. And uh, why don't you give us a little insight to uh, what the culture 
that you created here locally at General Informatics is today? Sure. So, you know, um, we have, every, most companies have a set of values and we have a set of values and defines and those values have been tweaked over time. Um, and each word has been taught many through because it should reflect who you are. And our first is, uh, you know, and um, can, can do, will do attitude. And it, it doesn't really rely, it's, whether it's tech company or any other company, the business values are people's values, right? And if you have people who can, can do and they will, will do it, that business is, has people who are ready to help the clients. We're in the services industry. So, you know, the, the servant mindset that we come to business, make sure you succeed every day. And for us to ensure that you succeed is also a thing, and our field changes every day, so a continuous growth in us is also important. And then, you know, so there were certain things, but and then we also realized that as we are continuously growing, if we go back to you, we have to remember the empathy factor, that, you know, um, not say, hey, you don't know this stuff. Or it has to be that, okay, uh, you hired us to help you with this, so we have to be empathetic to what you need. And, and, you know, and then we need to make money as a business too, but the money should be based uh, on efficiency and effectiveness of what we're doing. So if we can deliver results and we can do it efficiently, then as a business, we should. And last I would say is that we need to stay humble mm-hmm. when you do these things. So. Now, did you model any of that culture on any other uh, larger company that was successful in the past or was that organic? So um, I was fortunate to be part of a, peer group system over the years. And it was on a single company, but we would meet with other uh, owners uh, once a quarter kind of thing and discuss these things that what valued in a company's lifespan. And that's where a lot of things come came from. Um, insights on leadership. Uh, you know, when you look at what you have done, what you consider that you've done well as a leader of your company, what comes to mind? What's What are the in- important things to you in being a leader? That's a very, uh, you know, it's always a small but big question. Yeah. Um, I think it, ultimately, it's a company, is a company of people. You know, you bring people together. Um, you have to have, there needs to be an idea and a strategy. I always say ideas sometimes gets overrated. But, you know, there's a, for those ideas and strategy to happen, you need a discipline to execute. So I think all those factors come in that, you know, you need to be able to execute with the right team. And that's just, a, you know, you hear it all the time, but that's the prince, that is the basis of it. That you find the right group of people, you have a good idea, and then you together execute that. Um, and you need to lead with example. So, Yeah, I, I sense that that might have been, leading by example may have been a, a big part of your style. Because um, I, could, I, I could see... I can see that happening. So, uh, general informatics, like the um, the industries that you serve, you're in um, education and medical. What other industries do you yeah, serve? We're in healthcare, education, government, um, financial world, insurance. So, I mean, you know, we're pretty broad in general informatics because practically everybody uses computers, right? You know, so and if they need assistance for that. Uh, you need to still understand the business a little bit to make sure the right applications are working. So we have teams which specialize in certain verticals, and uh, but it's a pretty broad. So what's your insight on um, uh, telehealth? Sure. Like this, it's, it's well, what is telehealth? Sure. So it's remotely, just like what we're doing with video conferencing today, and we don't have to meet to meet. Uh, similarly, we don't have to meet the doctor or get connected to a machine. Can we do it remotely without having to drive or walk or get to the place? So that's really telehealth number one. Number two is uh, there's an, another extension of telehealth is as software gets better and you add um, artificial intelligence, and you know that word is again one of those words where what does it mean kind of thing, but it's really where software starts seeing your old data and start thinking like a human. And saying, hey, I can see you have, whenever you eat these things, you have this problem. So it doesn't, you know, even software can figure it out that whenever you said you had this problem, you did something. So let me, let me try to stop you without a person having to tell you that. So when artificial intelligence, because we have been collecting our data for a few decades now. And now we can throw that data to computers and say, hey, can you find some trends here for us? And can you help me take good decisions based on those trends, even though I may miss some trends? So with telehealth, doing it remotely 
and the physicians getting assistance from these softwares to make uh, decisions for you or you yourself getting that input yourself so you can be more preventative. Um, so I think that's all coming together. It's really interesting how COVID uh, has been this, this, this catalyst catalyst for change uh, and particularly as it relates to it where you know i don't know but i but maybe a year ago i think if you uh told people that you wanted to you know see the doctor remotely by video they i don't think so but sure. now it's it's almost accepted universally and the same as working remotely i know there were you know many people uh that that feared that that productivity would go down and so many people are now are saying, Hey, that's not the case. Of course there are exceptions to that, but, um, it's really helped, uh, spur a lot of growth in, uh, in this it way. And, and, uh, so that's really, that's really, um, fascinating. Absolutely. Um, okay. Well, I just, uh, I wanted to have one last question with you. I'm, I'm, sure. I love branding, right. And, and, uh, how businesses brand themselves. And I'm curious what you thought about branding and particularly as it relates to, you know, how you grow uh, through acquisitions or we, you grow over, over the future. How do you see uh, the power of the general informatics brand, what it is today and, and what that may look like? Sure. Moving forward. So, um, I think brand is very important, I think, you know, and, and, and brand is built over time, right? And, and it, sometimes it's over time or some, sometimes it's a very quick, but with great quality. So uh, it's, it's a, so I feel that, you know, it's, it's taken almost 20 years to build this brand. And uh, I had just talking to one of the clients and they said, Mel, we've worked with many vendors, but one thing we like is you always deliver as a company. And, and they said, if tomorrow you went into air conditioning, we'll have you as an air conditioning vendor. <laughs> So, but that back goes back to your other question about the culture of a company. That, you know, a brand also represents a culture and culture is the people ultimately. So if you are, if your people are doing the right job in the right direction and moving in the right direction and together, you can build a brand. Now you can represent a brand. You know, we always, when we named the company, the idea was we have these big companies, General Motors, General Electric, you know, all these companies are general in the front. Oh. So maybe we can be, uh, and we wanted to be general computers, but that was trademarked, so we couldn't do it. And then informatics is really, is a actually more appropriate word, but really it's a mouthful. So in retrospect, you know, we should have picked a simpler word to put <laughs> there. So, uh, but overall we were kind of gearing for a bigger uh, company and hopefully we're going in that direction now. Well, look, I love learning the stories behind things like that, the name of, the, of a business. Mo, look, I appreciate you joining us today. I love learning about your company and about your plans for the future, and it was great uh, visiting with you. So I appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. Likewise. Thank you so much. I know I say this a lot, but it is just a great pleasure to sit down and talk with people like Mo. I love his realization of the American dream story, growing up in India, realizing there's opportunity in the United States and then executing on it. The other thing I love about his story is how it's a realization of a complete entrepreneurial journey from startup to uh, growth of his business, to taking part in acquisitions and then divisions where he's into hardware and software. And then ultimately his uh, sell to a private equity firm, which is going to give him the capital to grow his business even further. Fantastic story. Enjoyed listening to and talking to him so much. So Mo can be found online at 365labs.com, where you'll find some links to his Facebook and LinkedIn uh, pages. We appreciate you joining us, and we will catch you next time. Thank you for listening to the Next Entrepreneur Podcast. We'd like to thank our title sponsor, Mainspring Companies. It can be reached online at mainspringcompanies.com. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach us at ask at nxtentrepreneur.com. You can subscribe to the Next Entrepreneur Podcast on Apple Music, Spotify, Stitcher, or iHeartRadio. You can help support our podcasts by leaving a review on Apple Music. You can follow us on Facebook, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. 
please share this episode with your family and friends. The Next Entrepreneur is produced by Propel Productions. They can be reached at propelyourstory.com. Today's episode was produced by Daniel Sagona.